I don't. Of okay. course. <laughs> Just wanted to get that bit it's of bookkeeping out case. of the way. <laughs> uh, we have a question in the audience. Um, up there, yes. Children? There has been a very uh, recent, uh, quite a bit of increase of use of psychedelics in various therapeutic applications. Uh, the, the study of uh, studies are going on in Los Angeles and one other area, I forget where, of the use of something like psilocybin or uh, uh, MDMA in administering to people who have terminal cancer to alleviate the anxiety of that. These have been quite successful. There have been studies in the, uh, in the um, post-traumatic syndrome, uh, again, uh, to relieve anxiety. There are uh, probably half a dozen such studies either underway now or uh, in, the, in the machinery of approval to be done. The primary negative of this entire area is the public opinion, the legal status, the general attitude of the authorities that any work with these materials is probably basically evil makes the getting of permission from the authorities, be it, be it health, be it drug authorities, uh, virtually impossible to get. And hence, there will be a long struggle for any of these material, these uh, studies to become real. The funding is no question. The funding is available from many sources. It's the uh, machinery of, of, the, um, of the permission getting that has been difficult. This, I don't see being re uh, re uh, uh, softened at all until the as has happened in Europe to some extent and more and more, this entire area of research moves from legal control to medical control. And I think that transformation will probably allow many of these mm -hmm. studies to be done. Dr. Kandel? Yeah, I want to uh, come to the defense of Christoph Koch, not that he needs it from me. Uh, but I have followed as, a, uh, as an outsider with considerable interest uh, the work that he and Francis Crick have done over the last uh, 20 odd years on the problem of consciousness. And I think we all would say, including the two of them, that they have not moved the problem brilliantly in empirical terms. Nonetheless, if you think of how fuzzy our thinking was about those issues 20 years ago and how clarified it has become because of their continuous evolution in their thinking, you have to say this is remarkable progress. Uh, and I think that in addition to methodological advances, there are conceptual advances, and they have helped us think through a number of ways that we could, in principle, study consciousness, which we didn't have before. And I'm a little bit reminded of, um, of another conceptual advance of this sort. I mean, everyone points to Schrodinger's important book, What is Life, and why did it influence so many physicists to come into the field, and even influence certain biologists, because it pointed out the role of the gene in information transfer. So it changed biochemistry from being influenced by primarily being focused on energetics to the flow of information within cells. And I think that you and Francis have accomplished this for us. You've given us certain ways of thinking about it which we didn't have before. So in that context, I want to ask you a specific question. I thought that you were going to devote your lecture on the claustrum and how the claustrum brings together activity in the posterior parietal cortex and the prefrontal cortex to give us consciousness. And I realized that this was only an idea thrown out sort of as you were evolving in your thinking, but I wonder what your current thinking is as to whether there is some group of cells that ties together the activity of a number of cortical circuits in order to give you this unifying function. Okay, so the, so the claustrum, for those who don't know, it's a structure in mammals, I think all mammals have it, that's sort of underneath the, the insula, underneath the, the, the front part of the of cortex, it's bilateral. It's unique in the sense it gets input from every other, it gets input from every cortical area and projects back to every cortical area. It's very thin, it's a, sort of a, almost a single layer sheet of neurons. No, nobody has any idea, um, very few people study, it's obviously there in, in us also. And um, 
so if you look at the structure, you know, and you follow structure function, you immediately infer that it must have to do something with integration. So we were talking this morning, Axel was talking this morning about, about, uh, about the binding problem. It seems like an ideal structure to do that. The only relevant studies right now is fMRI, and they suggest it's involved in cross-modal integration. When you have, when you have more than one sensory, let's say visual and auditory, then that structure gets very, um, gets very active. So, so that would support that. But because it's very thin, it's, it's thinner than a single voxel. So it's very difficult to separate it from the underlying basal ganglia and from the overlying cortex. So they're, they're mental logical problems. And I think what has to happen is what you did in the amygdala. You have to find a gene that's specifically expressed there and then try to inactivate it or activate it and then manipulate it. But it's just too difficult to study in humans. Any other? Anybody? Their hands up? Yes, sir. Up in the cheap seats. Go ahead. Yeah, there, there are plenty around. I mean, if I ask you to do a difficult problem, if you're, if you're unconscious, you're not going to be able to do it. So there was a paper by Larry Squire in Science a couple of years ago using trace versus delay conditioning. And uh, the, the evidence shows, and other people have replicated it, that um, if you do um, um, uh, delay conditioning where the CS and US overlap, you don't need to be aware of it, of the, of the, of the CS and US relationship. But if in trace, in order to be conditioned, but for if you had a trace condition, you know, in other words, if there's an interval between, let's see, the tone and the, and the shock, or the, uh, then you, ha you have to be conscious of, the, of that. You would what? He said you cannot he use said that. If it's an animal, is, is that because it's an animal? So A, you can do the same experiments in bees and in, fly, in, in flies, right? You can do delay and trace conditioning. How do I know you're conscious? I don't really know you're conscious. I infer you're conscious, okay, because of similarity to me, similarity in behavior, and because of the legal system. If I don't treat you as conscious, I'm going to be in trouble, okay? So, so <laughs> how, how do I infer that a monkey is conscious? How do I know my dog? I mean, René Descartes, about, René Descartes makes a falling outrageous statement. He says, if you ride in a carriage, I mean, this is a French dualist, right? If you ride in a carriage over a dog and the dog cringes and, and, and yelps, don't believe he's conscious because he's just rest, he's rest, just rest agitans. It's just behavior. We today, we think the, the animal actually has pain, actually has all the subjective, the, the negative aspect of pain. Why? Because of similarity in behavior, similar nervous system, and evolutionary continuity. So, it, you know, it's, it's, I don't think it's that difficult to infer consciousness in, in, other, in, in uh, other organisms. If, if an animal shows empathy for another animal, does that mean it has consciousness? I mean, uh, it depends. I mean, it depends how you operationalize it. I'll but. ask this because I interviewed a, 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 someone who works with bonobos and chimpanzees. He said there's a world of difference between a bonobo and a chimp, and bonobos really exhibit so many, so many aspects of that are hum, much more human-like that you, if you study them, you'll get more an idea of what you know our closest relatives are like. And he, and he talked very much about the empathy that they have to other other animals. I mean, it's almost like they were talking about this animal being conscious of the, the feelings of the other animal. Well, there are lots of experiments, both on, on regular chimpanzees, uh, pantroglodytes, as well as bonobos, showing, so to speak, theory of mind, so that uh, the one animal will show a behavior that indicates that it has an understanding of what the other animal